conducting APSE CME educational series. I always look forward to this particular series of fellows teaching course, Save a Life on Unusual Causes and Complications of Acute Coronary Syndrome. This event is organized by the APSC, endorsed by the Singapore Cardiac Society, the Asian Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology, EBEC accredited for CME in collaboration with Medtronic. A date stamp today is the 3rd of March, 2022, 5 p.m. Singapore time on the Thursday. My name is Jack, your chair for today, the immediate past president for the APSC as well as the ISCP. Again, we're very happy to welcome Professor Tan Bui Chim from the National University Heart Center, Singapore, to narrate and show us his amazing series of cases on unusual causes and complications. We really, really learn a lot from his series of cases. Our esteemed panelists will include Dr. Chu Gim Hui, consultant cardiologist at CV Central Kuala Lumpur, also a big stakeholder in Anheim, Malaysia. Our second panelist is Professor Ashok Seth, the chairman of the Fortis Escort Heart Institute, chairman as well of the Cardiology Council at Fortis Group of Hospital from India. He's the current standing president for EPSIC for the region. We're very happy that we have three fellows who put their hands up to volunteer to be punished here. Today we have Dr. Tay Yi Sin from National Heart Institute, Malaysia, Dr. Lam from Hong Kong, as well as Dr. Gufran from Pakistan. They are going to help go through this series of cases. So quickly on the objective, we want to use this case-based learning session and is blinded to both our faculty as well as our fellows to look out for unusual causes and complications of acute coronary syndrome and learn to save a life from this series. We really want to learn the tips and tricks from Professor Tan Wee Chim, Professor Ashok Seth, as well as Gim Hui for, to teach our fellows and ourselves. A pitch for upcoming webinars, uh, 11 of March, we have an ECG case competition, a series of ECG submitted by fellows across the region. <clears throat> 18 of March, we have a map master program narrating to the latest evidence for high bleeding risk PCI and RDN. A few housekeeping uh, announcements. This webinar is copyrighted by the APSC. The views belong solely to the faculty members. The webinar is currently made live stream by Wonder APSC Facebook as well as YouTube pages. CME points will be submitted for those who are connected throughout the full duration of this Zoom webinar. You will then receive your certificate of attendance sent by email post survey. Please click on to the Q&A button below if you have any questions for our faculty as well as speakers, and we'll try to answer all of them. So let's get started, and uh, we look forward to Huichim show us his amazing series of cases. Uh, Huichim, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be part of this APSC uh, Fellows Teaching course, and always nice to be uh, hearing from, from the rest of my esteemed colleagues as well, Ashok, Gim Hui, and yourself, and uh, involving the fellows as well. So this is a part four series of uh, unusual causes of acute myocardial infarction. And in today's episode, I'd like to share with you uh, two patients uh, with interesting ECG and then uh, one case of uh, patients with unusual cause of myocardial infarction. So if you recall in the uh, last uh, uh, episode three, we had a patient who presented with this ECG when he had a acute myocardial infarction involving the inferior uh, RCA. And then it, he's got this uh, high uh, ST elevations, B1, B2, and it, this, uh, all these changes turn out to be just merely uh, RV uh, infarctions that give rise to this, uh, uh, this vector shift that causes this ST to be elevated in the anterior lead. So this is rather unusual presentation of an inferior RV myocardial infarction. <clears throat> so let's go on to today's case. This is a 33-year-old Indian migrant worker smoking if it's, as a cardiovascular risk factor, chest pain of eight hours. And this is his ECG. And so perhaps uh, some so comments. So we will yeah. start again, uh, which in with our uh, fellows first, Dr. Lam from Hong Kong. Do you mind if you unmute yourself and I read this ECG? Yes, uh, sure, no problem. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. So um, um, uh, according to this ECG, there's an um, obvious uh, ST elevations over lead inferior leads at uh, lead 2, 3, and AVF and also reciprocal changes over the 1AVL as well. So this is a uh, typical inferior MI, 
In addition to that, there is also ST depressions over the V2, which may be suggestive of some posterior uh, wall involvement as well. Uh, moreover, there is some mild ST elevations over V5 and V6. I would suggest this would be a very large dominant, um, uh, probably a uh, dominant uh, right uh, coronary uh, su uh, in supplying the inferior wall, posterior wall, and lateral walls in functions, or a uh, uh, very dominant left circumflex will, will be a um, um, uh, uh, lower priority of the differential diagnosis. Thanks, uh, Dr. Lam. Dr. Tay, uh, can you let me know whether you agree with Dr. Lam and whether there's any RV involvement on this ECG? Um, yeah, I totally agree with Dr. Lam that this is an inferior MI. Um, but if possible, I would like to get the right side that uh, ECG to look at the RV involvement. The V1, V2 ST depression, which quite suggestive of this uh, posterior involvement as well. The R3 culprit, you think, Dr. Tay? Um, is it a guess? Most likely is uh, RCA current, RCA. Uh, Professor Ashok, Seth, uh, anything to add on if you have this um, ECG? Uh, Ashok, you're muted at the moment. Sorry. Uh, we, we still don't hear Ashok, so we'll go to Gimhui first. Uh, Gimhui, anything else to add on for this ECG? I think that the ECGs have been well described uh, by our fellows. Uh, to a point that you asked, which could be the carpre vessel, the clue, I think here, you look at the ST elevation in lead two and three, the inferior leads, it's higher in three. So suggesting it's more likely to be the RCA rather than the circumflex. So uh, I, I think just uh, my finishing point before Ashok comes in and we move on, is that I, I think I agree with you, clear cut inferior MI plus minus posterior. There's some discrepancy in V1 yeah. versus V2 ST segment. So you have isoelectric V1, rather than the elevation, it gives me a hint that there could be oh. right ventricular involvement. If there is right ventricular involvement, then it's clearly a right uh, coronary artery. Again here, the, the thing that's a bit odd is that laterally you have ST elevation. So either a very huge uh, RCA with posterior involvement as well, or a huge dominant circumflex, yeah. unlikely multi-territory. So I uh, should, uh, yeah, can we you can hear, hear me? me now. Oh, yeah. good, okay. Good, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Hui Chin, you want to go ahead? Yes. So we do the angiogram on the uh, left side first. So um, maybe you can go back to Dr. Lam and first. Uh, are you, does this agree with the ECG changes? Uh, yes, I can see that there's a, uh, the, obviously the pointer is showing that there's a uh, absence for over the distal uh, circumflex artery. So um, uh, I'm, I, I may need uh, other views to see is there uh, also it is a dominant left circumflex applying the left PDA as well. Of course, we would like to see more over the um, uh, RCA uh, coronary angiogram. But by this uh, angiogram, uh, seems as the uh, vessels, uh, uh, some atactic vessels, uh, but more or less uh, not too much disease. Some disease over the proximal LAD are otherwise uh, uh, not too unhealthy to me. Uh, yeah. Uh, any comments from Prof. Ashok Seth or Kim Hui? Are you surprised by this angiographic finding based on the ECG? Ashok, you want to go first or uh, I'll just yeah, give you a, go first, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, I, I think you can see that the distal circumflex is really truncated. Because one will be tempted to think that that could be the infarct carpal vessel, but looking at there's actually intracoronary collaterals going right beyond that. I'm just thinking that this is probably a chronic CTO or the distal circumflex. I still feel that when I look at the right, I suspect the right is the carpal vessel, and the ischemia that extends to the lateral wall, uh, which could be related to the ischemia that's also contributed by the CTO or the distal circumflex. The, yeah, I, 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 show us I, I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. Go, go ahead, Ashok. Sure, sure. So the, when I look at it, of course, what's not clear is whether this is a dominant circumflex. We can't see the PDA and OM2 in this projection. I would like to see that, but this to me still doesn't exclude the fact that there could be an RC occlusion. 
And therefore, I think I'm interested in seeing the RCA. If this is a dominant circumflex, perhaps, uh, and, and was collateralizing the RCA in some manner, then I would expect that this led to an infarction in this territory as well as in the RC territory if the RC is occluded and collateralized. On the other hand, it could be two vessel occlusion. This could be chronic, the other one could be acute. Uh, so I think uh, I would still go for the fact that it's possible that so circumflex and RC are both occluded. Does this look Which like a occluded, across, occluded right? or chronically occluded vessel to your? This does not look chronically occluded to me because there's dye staining. There's a hemiscus there. You can actually see that. This looks to me a thrombotic vessel. Uh, so yes, and, and, and that, if I was just to give you one view of this uh, with the limited projections, it doesn't look chronically occluded. It looks acutely occluded. So would you all deal with it? Could so you mind the RCA? Yes. Uh, we need to yeah, so it. before we go to the RCA, the operator took the shot here and thought this was the culprit lesion and you went ahead. So this is the uh, the balloon. It took actually a large balloon, and this is the circumflex. Right. Yes, the lesion was crossed quite easily with a soft wire. All right. And you can see that there was ectasia there, which could have been thrombus. Dr. Tay, before we show you the RCA, is this a dominant sub, you think? Um. I, I believe it could be the core dominance, but this is, I only have a one the quarter view. Um, I generally, uh, for the patient who came in with the STEMI, I will do the, uh, the, the one the diagnostic on the non-culprit and, uh, and the guiding to the, the another angiogram of this uh, culprit artery. Then only I will decide which is the, uh, uh, the lesions. Uh. Which in? Uh, so, you know, actually, if you start out with this one, and this looks like acutely occluded artery, you don't have to go and do the right, but you just fix it first and then go, you can always go to the right again later on. But would this be sufficient to account for the ECG changes? I, I would defer to the professors here. Uh, Gimwe? You don't think so. You, you still don't think so, right? Uh, Ashok? I the right. No, I don't think so. And I would have really, uh, had this been the only... I would have actually seen a lot more posterior wall changes than was seen. Uh, this would have been true posterior infarction than this circumflex, uh, clearly. Okay, so, so, uh, so everybody don't believe this is a culprit lesions. Okay, so uh, indeed the patients still have a persistent chest pain after opening up this uh, circumflex artery. And so we went to the right. So we're gonna, Take a pause here for Dr. Grufriend, if you can unmute yourself to comment on this right. Does this look acute or chronic to you? Dr. Grufriend, can there's you a, yeah. yes. go ahead. So there's a proximal, proximal 100% occlusion of RCA. And uh, I'm not able to appreciate any integrated flow. So there's a proximal 100% occlusion. Dr. Tay, your comment? Um, when, you had, when we are doing this uh, left coronary angiogram, I didn't see any collateral to the right side. So I think this is most likely still a, acute occlusion. Uh, I, I agree Dr. with that too. Yeah, because I there's no obvious collaterals from the left side. And I think it's uh, the uh, from occlusions look a bit uh, acute to me as well. Look like there's a probably some from best over there. So with the fact that I think Huichim showed us a cert, it crossed quite easily. I mean, there are uh, cases where we have seen synchronous MI of both arteries simultaneously. And then the cert probably does explain the V5 and 6 ST elevation. And the rest is accounted for by this, right? I, I will wait for Huichim to show us more then. Huichim? So <clears throat> if you look at the uh, right-sided chest lead, which I didn't share with you earlier on, there were some elevations of the uh, V4R, V5R, and V6R. So the op operator crosses quite easily with a, a wire and then managed to uh, re-perfuse the uh, right coronary artery, put in a uh, stent, and this is the uh, final result. <clears throat> 
So the question here has always been, this is the uh, post-PCI ECG before the patient uh, was discharged. And you can see that there's actually a Q wave in the inferior leads and T wave inversions and some lateral changes as well. So the question has always been, uh, how do you tell a right from the left circumflex in the patients with inferior myocardial infarction? Around about uh, 20 years ago, I actually did a study with uh, the late Professor Chambon Locke and trying to look at the uh, lead two and three and uh, using lead one as well to see uh, how we can actually identify a corporate lesions after a uh, patient's coming in with inferior myocardial infarction. So we look at quite a number of patients. We look at 72 patients with RCA infarct and 20 patients with left circumflex artery infarct. And this is what we reported here. So in the left circumflex artery, when you have a lead two of ST, which is higher than lead three, uh, this is going to be most likely a circumflex artery. But when you have a ST elevation that is the same in lead two and lead three, and you see an isoelectric lead one, then this is going to be circumflex as well. But when you have a lead three that is higher than lead two, or you have a ST that is depressed in lead one, then this is going to be RCA. So this is our, our findings, uh, which was uh, published in AJC uh, around about 22 years ago. And so, so the sensitivity and specificity are very high because if you look at the uh, ST ratio of two and three, you find that we are always looking at uh, two or higher than three for circumflex is nearly 100%, okay? When you see a ST that is elevated in lead one, it's almost 100% circumflex artery. Okay, so likewise, uh, then the rest are probably not as uh, high in terms of specificity, but still pretty good. So I think it's a, a good guide here to, uh, in your clinical practice, to really identify the corporate edition and impress your fellows and, you know, how you actually can tell which vessel is involved here. Huichim, can I ask a quick question? Uh, it's always great that Huichim showcases and he publishes the data as well. So your previous slide, can I just reference back to the V5, V6 here? I see also that it's something I didn't know before, that you also have a pattern of V5, V6 SA elevation in mm. circumflex here. Is that what you're showing us in the precordial leads? Yes. Maybe you can teach us yeah. a little bit on the precordial leads as well. But the thing about this is that we didn't find a very high specificity and uh, you know, with regard to these findings. So it's not a consistent finding that we can actually put a bet on, but certainly the ratio of two and three and lead one is something that uh, will really guide you as far as the corporate edition goes. Hey, can, I other can, I can, I have, can I just ask you another question? Because I'm intrigued by your findings. Uh, I always understood the fact that if you have a true posterior infarction, which is represented truly by what you see in the RCA, which I actually mean not just V2, but it goes to V3, V4, that ST segment depression pattern, which is the ST elevation pattern for the true posterior infarction. That is, is so much for the circumflex and especially for a dominant circumflex. Um, from what I look at it, you seem to be showing less ST segment depression and anteriorities in the circumflex infarctions. Yeah, so this is, we are looking at inferior MI here. We didn't look specifically for posterior MI here. So this is really looking at a whole series of inferior MI with ST elevations. Right. Okay, yeah, sure. sure. Uh, Gimui, any other ECG teaching points here? It's very interesting here. So it's quite basic as well. Nothing to add, I think it's all explanatory. Yeah, so think... the, the other pointer that I referenced to was the fact that if you do diagnose a uh, right ventricular infarction, that is clearly a RCA. So that's the other thing that is pretty clear. I think the posterior can go either way. And of course, in all inferior MI, do watch out for conduction blocks uh, for those cases. Uh, Hui Chin, back to you. Okay, so we're done with the first case. Now- Yeah, but just one comment. Uh, okay. Again, to understand that simultaneous uh, occlusions of vessels are known to happen. Uh, those who do primary PCIs regularly would have to come across these situations not unusually, uh, and then we confuse around this. So I think the HNG of message so valid and so correct. And on occasions, one does have to open up both vessels. And it's only when you wire them down that you start understanding that the vessel you thought was acute actually turns out to be chronic and uncrossable. And the vessel you thought was chronic occlusion turns out to be the one which is easier to cross strengthen and was the, was the culprit. Mm. So maybe if I can ask our colleagues as well, what do you teach your fellows if you think that this is a primary PCI? Do you ask them to do a diagnostic of the other vessel first and then go to the 
suspected culprit or you will just um, do that, take diagnostic and then and decide after that? Uh, Ashok, uh, your practice in... Oh, absolutely. My practice, I would actually go for the first, the, the non-culprit, theoretically, the non-culprit vessel first injected. Make sure that I see that, understand that vessel, make sure that I see collateral, what I think is the culprit vessel, and then go to the culprit vessel. A single shot of the other is valuable in terms of exactly these sort of decision-making and strategizing the approach to what you think is the culprit lesion. Quichin, your Actually, comments? Actually, I'm a little bit different here. So once we diagnose on ECG and believe which one is the culprit, we go straight for it with a guiding catheter. So if this is a patient that I see, I'm just going to take a right uh, guiding catheter and go straight for it. And then after that, come back to the non culprit lesion and take a diagnostic shot. So I'll do it. it was a great different. So that will shorten the D2B time a lot. It was a great question from uh, Kim Wee. I think the take home message for the fellows is not whether you do a non diagnostic uh, diagnostic for non culprit or go straight for the culprit. But more importantly, so before you put anything in the patient, have in your mind an idea of where the lesion is. I think that's why reading the ECG carefully is very, very important. I think either approach has its merits, so I don't think we're going to debate that, Kim Hui. I think both has its merits. I, I actually do what Ashok does. Uh, I, I tend to shoot the non culprit to see collaterals, make sure I don't have any issue there before I tackle the culprit. So perhaps we move on, uh, Hui Chin. Okay. So this is another young Indian migrant worker. So we always have about the, you know, the Indian term migrant worker coming with MI in their 30s. So this is a gentleman that coming with chest pain for three hours. Any idea? Dr. Grufen, are you still on? If you can comment. If he has dropped out at all, then we'll have Dr. Tay first this time. Probably I will comment. So um, look at this ECG, it's quite a prominent ST elevation at the inferior lead, more of at this uh, lead 3 AVF, and also the lateral lead involvement, V4, 5, 6. Um, if we coded with this uh, previous uh, prof dance uh, study, this uh, ST segment deviation at the lead 3 is still higher than the lead 2. So um, this is still an inferior uh, lateral MI, but also I will request for this uh, right-sided ECG as well. I think this is still a RCA involvement. Um, and okay. this, uh, which is this uh, precordial left-sided ECG, not right-sided ECG, right? No, this is precordial, yeah. Okay, Dr. Lam, uh, you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with uh, Dr. Tay. I think uh, I, I have a few uh, differential diagnosis in my mind. First, I think uh, I agree with Dr. Tay that because there's a ST elevations in uh, inferior leads and lead three is higher than lead two together with reciprocal ST depression over one AVL. Um, this could be a um, uh, inferior wall MI together with um, the ST elevation over V1 over V2, it may suggest uh, some RE involvement and the V5 to V6 address of lateral wall involvement. However, the thing is, I think a somewhat a typical here is that the uh, pre uh ST elevation are more prominent than the usual uh, uh, just RCA uh, 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 infarction. I think the other possibility is could be a very large LAD, which is uh, possibly a very um, large anterior wall MI and also wrap around apical uh, 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 LAD suggesting the inf uh, supplying the inferior wall as well. It could be another possibility. The other possibility is that uh, probably is still an RCA territory, uh, RCA uh, acute occlusions, but there is some chronic occlusions in the uh, left side system, which are supplied by uh, the collaterals from the right side. It, so it may, uh, appear as a ECG like this as well. So there's a few differential diagnoses in my mind. Very good points, Dr. Lam. Uh, Dr. Grufen, anything else to add on your end? I agree with my colleagues. There is more ST elevation in lead three as compared to in lead two, and there are lateral involvement with the ST elevation in V4 to V6. And it's, it appears to be like a uh, lateral MI, and I would like to take patient to the cath lab. Uh, Prof. Ashok Seth, uh, any any other professoral points here? Where do you suspect is a problem? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just confused about the QS pattern appearing in V4, V5, V6, uh, which is uh, not so prominent uh, in the other leads. Could it be a huge posterior lateral branch, which is which is massive and is occluded, it goes to the lateral, it goes to the lateral side. Uh, you know, that's that's what I would think. Uh, but I'm intrigued. Uh, so, do you think the ST is the elevator in the anterior leads? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, it is. It is elevated in the anterior leads. Uh, but the yeah, the other the other way it could be is that if it's got a huge LAD, which goes all round down the apex, but again. It still doesn't fit in with that completely. So a participant actually uh, feedback uh, from uh, Harry say that he's suspecting could this be a type A aortic dissection, for example, in the Marfans with a uh, simultaneous uh, effect on both coronary osteo, I guess. Uh, that's one interesting thought. Gimui, any, anything to add from your side? Uh, just, just one more question, uh, Just one more question. Is this yes. guy... Does, does he take drugs? Is he has he, is, it, is there a history of drug abuse? No, uh, no, none whatsoever. Yeah, it's presents with typical chest pain in this EP. Yes, so, so just say that I was very impressed with the very diffuse ST segment elevations all over anterior and inferior leads. They also evolve already Q waves in the infralateral leads. Hard to be committed in terms of which is the culprit, but I'm thinking number one differential is there's a definitely a STEMI. Um, maybe inferior, but in the presence of underlying multivessel disease, or it could also be an anterior STEMI with the previous infarction on the right or through the right. So multivessel or LED wrap around until the inferior aspect of the heart. Uh, Thanks. Just one more, one more point. Um, in, in, in the thought process, he's got quite significant ST elevation all, all around. It'd be interesting to see whether he's even got a minoka, he's got normal coronary arteries. Could it be something else happening. And that, that I think is another important aspect to add on to, to the angiogram would add on to this. It could be a minoka. It could be something else totally. It's just too widespread ST elevation uh, and a, a very odd pattern which doesn't fit into anything that I can understand. So I, I think we all agree is uh, two territory or multi-territory uh, ST elevation. So the common differential is like what was narrated multi-territory uh, occlusion or single occlusion and collaterals. Uh, other differential like aortic osteo involvement, embolism, as well as uh, potentially even systemic processes like fulminant myocarditis. I mean, all these are possibilities, but I think we're all thinking on the MI track in a 33-year-old young man, but I think other differential cannot be excluded. Uh, Huichim, uh, back to you. So then we have to bring the patients to the lab tonight. So. So do we did the right first. So we'll ask Dr. Grufan again to narrate to the coronary angiogram on the right. So this is a, a LA view showing proximal RCA to and there is a this seems to be a large thrombus in the proximal RCA. Anything else to add from Dr. Lam? Uh, yes, I agree that there's a uh, from best over large from best over the proximal LCA. I, I suspect there will be uh, the culprit lesions um, uh, leading to the MI. Can I just ask uh, Ashok now, you know, uh, which team likes to put in the guider straight to what he thinks is the culprit? Will you actually take a shot on the left before you intervene on this or you'll go straight for this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's possible that the LED is occluded and this was this could have been occluded in the past. The collaterals are coming to the RCA. You actually saw a QS elevation pattern, a QS pattern, not an acute ST elevation pattern in the inferior leads. Uh, I'm, I'm quite clear that this is going to be there's going to be an LED occlusion, and that's why we're seeing these widespread ST elevation changes. So uh, just because it looks acute doesn't mean that uh, that's acute. Unless we okay. look at the left. So I uh, sure it's quite adamant he'll shoot the left first. Um, Huichi, back to you. So this was quite easy to cross and uh, quite easy to stand as well. This is the RCA final results. Then of course we have to go to the left and take a look at, look at the LAD. Yeah. 
So Ashok is right. There, there is a looks like a proximal LED. What's the approval. patient's hemodynamics when he presented? He was holding well, you know. So you know, when you are young, uh, you can sort of withstand all these uh, insults actually. So we didn't have to put in a balloon pump actually. It's pretty well actually. Once you reperfuse, it becomes more stable. So indeed, this gentleman has a double vessel again to uh, AMI here. Uh, so two arteries occluding at the same time, so giving to rise to that, that interesting ECG presentations. So everybody's kind of right. LAD, RCA, uh, simultaneous occlusion here. Very well done. So, uh, so actually we have published a number of simultaneous thrombosis. Uh, so this is also one of my very early uh, uh, case report of a simultaneous coronary artery stenosis. So I want to come to this uh, interesting case uh, that we will discuss at uh, greater length. This is a young lady, 30 year old uh, Chinese lady with a family history of hypertension, pretty strong family history. Mother and three uncles had hypertension. Two uncles died of stroke at the age of 40 to 60. Another died of MI at age 58. Now she actually had a delivery of her first pregnancy uh, uh, about eight months ago, came back from Japan uh, one week ago with a complaint of fever. And then she developed acute chest pain and uh, shortness of breath for one day and was uh, transfer, uh, admitted to a, a regional hospital and then transferred to us because she was found to be in uh, cardiogenic shock. Uh, BP at that time was uh, 80 to uh, about 50. Uh, they managed to raise it to 165. Uh, heart rate was 100 to 145 per minute. Uh, she was afibra at the time when she uh, was uh, hospitalized and transferred over. This was an ECG when she was uh, admitted to uh, my center. We're going to take a pause here again. Maybe we'll start with Dr. Lam this time. Uh, your read of the ECG. Okay, sure. Um, so um, this ECG actually showing this patient is in uh, sinus tachycardia. And um, there is some, um, um, some degree of diffuse uh, ST depressions uh, over the inferior lids and uh, also really over uh, V6 as well. And um, there's a um, mild, uh, some ST elevations over AVL and also uh, the AVR as well. So um, basically it could be a, um, um, there's a, a few differential diagnosis in my mind. First of all, there's, this could be a uh, diffuse um, uh, subendocardial ischemia. It could be, uh, if this is an MI, it could be due to a, a large territory of um, ischemia, could be a uh, left main disease or a multivessel disease. But on the other hand, with uh, this young age, uh, together with history of uh, fever, uh, then other possibilities could be uh, other causes, including uh, myocarditis as well. And um, um, yeah, this is a uh, um, uh, thing goes through my mind, yeah. Good thoughts, Dr. Lam. Anything else to add, Dr. Tate? Um, I, when I look at this, uh, uh, yeah, it's a young lady, though there's a family history of the coronary artery disease, but she has the fever one week prior to that. And um, the, the risk of this uh, coronary artery disease at this young lady during the reproductive age is still relatively low. Uh, I, 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 my, my first differential, I would think of uh, like um, the myopericarditis. Um, given that the, it's non-specific ECG changes like sinus tachycardia, but when I look at the, S, uh, the PR segment depression at the, at the, at the, from the 12 ECG, I think there is some at the 2, 3, and there is a PR segment elevation at AVR and V1. So um, I still suspect probably this is a, a perimyocarditis features of ECG. So I'd like to ask Dr. Gufran, uh, after you see this ECG of this patient, what tests would you like to do for the patient? Uh, I would like to start with the echocardiogram. I would like to see the patient left ventricular ejection fraction and need to rule out the cause. So I would like to start with the echocardiogram. Thank you. Uh, Jim, back to you. We actually did a uh, biomarker uh, study first, and then uh, we could see some dramatic uh, uh, elevations of the uh, cardiac troponin here uh, from 7,008 rising to uh, 28, uh, 29,000. 
So uh, pretty uh, significant uh, elevations in terms of uh, biomarkers. We also did a chest x-ray before we go to everything else. Uh, any comment? Which may I know if the patient was hypoxemic? Uh, not hypoxemic, but hypotensive on the mission. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts there, Kim Hui? Maybe we can approach her. Uh, yeah, Jim and I first look at the history of this young lady. Uh, very low CV risk profile, recent travel from Japan. My first thought was actually acute pulmonary embolism, the sinus tachycardia, and the low BP. So that's why I was looking for hypoxemia as well. Excellent. In, in the Jack, uh, Prof Ashok, Seth, at this point? Yeah, <clears throat> at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, for me, that's, uh, you know, doesn't suggest to me anything, though, though yes, both myocarditis and remains one of the diagnosis and pulmonary embolism. But there was no S1, Q3, T3, I would have seen that, though the patient is hypertensive, I would, I would have seen a lot more uh, on the EKG had this been a massive pulmonary embolism. So apart from a tachycardia, I can't see anything. Uh, for me, the X-ray is, uh, is not as if... Uh, the patient has pulmonary embolism. I can see the, the it's not a blank lung on either on, on, on either side. So the, what has been said before. The the one I'm always a bit wary about. Uh, I, this is a strong possibility still. Thanks, Ashok. The one I always worry about in this type of history is that um, whenever the BP is up and down and they're very tachycardic in a young patient, uh, and you you're not quite grasping what's happening, trop T is high. You really, really have to be ready to go in and support a fulminant myocarditis, especially when the ST QRS intervals start to widen and they start to develop heart blocks. Uh, especially when you get this kind of enzyme and they're very vessel constricted. They are compensating with the blood pressure because they're young. But the moment they crash, they usually crash quite badly. But I agree with the rest. Uh, you have to exclude the other causes. The fever could be consistent with uh, some form of myocarditis as well. Uh, with a recent history, but the, the rest of the thoughts are good. Richim, I'm back to you. So how does it actually look to you? Does it, is it cardiomegaly, okay, well, congestion, you think? We'll get Dr. Gufran to comment uh, the x-ray. There is no obvious cardiomegaly, but there is a pulmonary upper lobe diversion and seems to be pulmonary congestion. So, so there's a little bit of congestion there. Uh, Dr. Tay, anything else you'd like to add on? No, no uh, nothing. So I, I would say that uh, I, I don't see a like an infection. I don't see a lot of oligemia. And it's surprising that there's, the costophrenic angle is not blunted. So it's not a very chronic process, whatever it is, to account for this BMP and uh, raised trot T. Uh, Hui Ching, are you yeah. showing us something else? No. So this is indeed the actual reports from the radio radiologist suggesting that there is actually a pulmonary venous congestion here. So uh, this is a series of blood tests. We'll take a pause here. Maybe I can get Dr. Lam to comment on the bloods again. Uh, okay, let me see. Um, right. Uh, the blood tests um, actually show that um, the... Sorry about that. Uh, so the white cell count is uh, elevated. Uh, so it's predominant uh, polymorphs. And uh, there's also some thrombocytosis as well. Some aminase was raised. I'm not sure it's some kind of uh, non-specific um, uh, elevations, but there is a, a deranged uh, kidney and um, together with the liver functions as well, suggestive of some uh, multi-organ involvements. Not sure is it related to the underlying uh, cardiogenic shock status, or it is a uh, systemic disease process. Um, and um, the carbon dioxide level is um, elevated. So I I'm not sure the units, but uh, probably is the, the patient is uh, having a respiratory failure, but I I'm not sure because the units may not be the same as mine using or at, at your lab. So, um, so that's what I'm seeing the case, yeah. Okay, carbon dioxide looks like it's down actually. Dr. Grufren, uh, any oh, right, right, right. observation yeah, yeah. to add on? So, yeah, so carbon dioxide looks like it seems to be like patient is in uh, uh, 
it's blowing out the carbon dioxide and uh, respiratory rate might be increased. So that's why his carbon dioxide was uh, down. Otherwise, uh, his uh, lab work up is showing that it's most likely uh, sepsis sub, sub, going on, which seems to be causing the cardiomyopathy and leading to congestive myocarditis. Anything else, Kim Hui? You 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 will add on to the bloods actually at this moment. Nothing much to add at the moment. Thanks. Uh, uh back to you, uh, Hui Chim. I I think usually I do throw in the lactate as well to just have a look. I'm I think the the <coughs> differential here is that the LDH ALP is slightly elevated. I don't see a lot of transaminitis. So this process is truly very very acute though. It and does look that it's affected the renal function some, but not very bad at the moment. Uh, agree with the lack of shift. Uh, you know, would have uh, expected to see the blood gases, uh, the whole blood gas profile, including the PO2, uh, and uh, lactose, as you said, and of course, echo would still form a part of the initial investigations. Mm. Thanks. Uh, Huichim? We brought her to the lab. The, the oxygenation was actually normal throughout the, uh, the entire course here. So she's uh, hyperventilating away. Uh, so we actually worry about the coronary. Uh, so uh, although I agree that uh, this is most likely not going to be uh, the usual ACS. The coronary do look normal on the left side. Do you agree? Dr. Tay? Ask the echo uh, uh, Ashok is asking again for the echo, but we'll go through the corridors first here then. Okay. <laughs> Since no, we no are interventionists, we yeah. do angiogram first. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. remember this patient came in cardiogenic shock, so we activate it as like a primary PCI. Although, although Hui Chim say it's normal, maybe you can go back to the left corridor show again. Dr. Okay. Tay, anything else you notice on the angiogram? Um, you know, the coronary is, arteries are quite normal, it's smooth, just that the contractility, you can see that apex and the base there, there are not much of movement. So apart of this uh, uh, coronary angiogram, I will do the uh, measuring the LVEDP as well for this patient. Yeah, so very good pickup. Uh, you can see the heart is actually not contracting at all and it's right. potential and tachycardic. So we Chin did do a hemodynamic here and Maybe Dr. Tay to finish up. What did you see on this left ventricular gram? Um, the, <clears throat> from from this uh, left ventricular uh, uh, ventricular gram, you can see that there is a uh, the hyperdynamic more on this uh, at the mid segment, the basal segment there. Anything else to add, Dr. Lam? Uh. Yeah, uh, I I'm I'm not seeing it quite quite clearly, but probably is the mid segment of the I agree with Dr. Tay is the mid segment of the uh, LV is more hyperdynamic than the other, but I'm not sure is this the uh, apical ballooning or not. Uh, I I I'm not quite uh, sure for for this image. Yeah. Uh, Gimui, do you, do you pick up anything else? I think there's definitely regional wall motion. It looks like at least the anterior wall is quite hyperdynamic, but the basal mid inferior is like hypo or akinetic. So there's definitely regional wall motion abnormality. Uh, Ashok, anything else? Yeah, yeah this is regional. Uh, and I know, I know that in the earlier projection, we see it better, but I think the apex is okay, but this is a mid-segment ballooning. I think this is this is pointing towards Takasubo. The ECG wasn't clearly Takasubo. This could be Takasubo. But this so, be double. I mean, the apex is. Uh, this apex is okay, but it could be yeah. still. One of the variants of the stress cardiac mouth. It's, so, it's certainly regional, and it's ballooning there. So we are we are thinking of apical ballooning, but there's tachycardia without marked ST elevation, and to me the regional wall looks over the place, not specific. The anterior wall also doesn't look like it's moving as well. There's no mm. hyperdynamic basal wall contraction. And also, I, I don't see a mitral regurgitation, which is important with the history of fever as well, I think, for valvular issues. And uh, the 
LV Graham looks like he's taking the whole aortic route, maybe to look out for aortic dissection as well. I'm not sure, uh, but I don't see anything there. Uh, Quichim, anything to teach us here? No, I think the, the, what it shows here is that there's multiple regional wall motion abnormality. I think the overall LV function is in, in, impaired here. And so I'm not going to disappoint uh, Ashoka. I certainly want to share with him uh, some other tests uh, that was done for this patient. This is your echo. So we'll go back to Dr. Gufren to you asked for the echo earlier. Yeah, this is a pastor along with the view. Sorry. Let's go to the other view. So pastor along as the view. So this is a I think this is a two-chamber view. So showing it's not running here properly. So it's showing the regional wall motion normality. So that's what, so now the two-chamber view. So perhaps we're gonna get uh, Dr. Lam to jump in here. Yeah, sure. Um, the transvaxic echocardiogram actually showed uh, global hypokinesia with uh, very poor uh, LV functions. Basically, I think it's only 10 to 20% uh, around. And uh, the LV seems a little bit distant to me. And uh, I'm not sure the actual LV size, but seems a little bit distended. And uh, I would like to proceed to the color dopper to exclude some uh, acute like uh, ruffler abnormalities, for example, AQAR or AQMR. Gimri, does it fit Takasubo type of echo? It doesn't fit a typical Takasubo. That cannot be excluded, of course. Uh, given the picture now, I think I'm looking at a severe myocarditis with uh, severe LV dysfunction at this point. Uh, Achok, anything else? Uh, you, you wanted well, echo. I think that's to add to what, what's been said, severe myocarditis is one, Takasubo is another one. But that's, that's about it for the moment. And yes. an MRI would be my next test. Which in? Okay. This is somewhat like the knee ventricle going to the apex. So you're right, the left ventricle just looks uh, really dilated here. In fact, there's severe biventricular systolic dysfunction. EF was 14% multiple regional wall motion abnormality. And so I'll tell you what happened to this patient uh, in the evolving uh, period. She had a progressive uh, cardiogenic shock. There was evidence of co freeze, elevated metabolic acidosis with high lactate. We had to put in the IBP to support her in the meantime. And then she was intubated and sedated. And she had actually had a brief cardiovascular collapse and cardiac arrest. So uh, CPR was performed for six minutes and the uh, VAMO was also started. So she was on ECMO, IBP, inotropes, intubated, and so forth. So things uh, took a turn to, uh, uh, for the worse uh, very quickly, as uh, Jack was saying. So what is your differential diagnosis now, up to now? <clears throat> Dr. T. Um, my differential diagnosis, of course, the first is still the uh, prominent myocarditis for this uh, young lady. Um, but I think this is my uh, most, like, most like diagnosis, and I, I will look for the causes of this myocarditis as there's a background history of traveling history. We we'll look for this uh, infectious, uh, doing some viral panel and look for the bacterial infection as well. Dr. Lam? Yes, I'm totally agree with that. I think this is a uh, fulminant myocarditis with uh, severe cardiogenic shock and multi-organ involvement. So most important thing, I think, apart from stabilizing the hemodynamics of the patients, is to look for any reversible cause of underlying myocarditis. Mostly of the myocarditis are viral in origins. We will give supportive treatment, we will see. But I think uh, in this situation, um, our cardio biopsy may play a role to well some uh, reversible causes, including like vasculitis, giant cell myocarditis, or some kind of even uh, other systemic um, immune disease. Uh, other immune panel, we have to uh, blood test for immune panel, we will have to take as well to rule out other reversible causes. Uh, Kim Hui, would cardiac biopsy be your next reach here? Not, not at this point in, in the management. I think it's the supportive, support the patient, treat whatever and ongoing problem um, 
infection, you want to make, make sure the kidney is okay. Um, although suffers when the patient is a bit better than we may consider a biopsy. I don't think it's going to change my, my management at this point in time with a biopsy. Uh, Professor Ashok, um, yeah. for your oh, reach yeah. for fulminant myocarditis, do you yeah. usually use a VA ECMO or a, a LV venting device at the moment? Uh, yeah, this is um, this is global, and I'm sure the echo would have picked up right heart failure, uh, and therefore I think uh, no LV venting comes later. But I want to actually, and I think Richie uh, mentioned that I think he had, there was both we ECMO and an IVP in uh, Richie. Uh, was yep. that the case? That's right. So he's he's at least done part of it. Uh, you know, he could have moved on to a impeller, and that would have been the the best way for LV venting, but he's at least got partial venting and he's decreasing half the load for, for the, the VFMO. Uh, for me, uh, this is clearly fulminant myocarditis and COVID would be one of the possibilities. Would you, is your standard practice to give uh, pulse metal prednisolone if you suspect that, or in this case, you would not? Ashok? Uh, I think that you know, if, if it depends upon the viral panel, and of course, clearly, I, I would, uh, this is a losing game if we don't actually do something about it, and I would actually go for pulse therapy. Um, Whom we at every point as towards myocarditis. Quichin, back to you. Uh, do, are you showing us some differential diagnosis here? These were the thoughts uh, going through our mind at that point in time. Like everybody, we think of fulminant myocarditis, Takasubo cardiomyopathy, possible, but very rare in this age group. And uh, LV doesn't look quite like an apical ballooning. Or is this just a dilated cardiomyopathy with some kind of uh, trigger here? You know, some kind of infections that trigger off a acute uh, failure here? Or is this some kind of hypertensive emergency here that causes the uh, high LV to fail? Massive pulmonary embolism, th thought about it, but not likely here. So uh, what, what happened after this? One of the participants actually had a good uh, other uh, possibility, which is a postpartum cardiomyopathy that was not picked up since she recently had a child. And uh, that's probably one of the other dimensional or number three, mm -hmm. some form of dilated peripartum cardiomyopathy with triggers. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Jeff, Jeff, there's just only one point against it, that the LV at least wasn't chronically dilated. It seems to have been, it seems to be, uh, you know, poorly contractile, but uh, if you remember, recall, it's not as if it's a dilated heart. And that was what I thought was against the fact that she had a long-standing my uh, cardiomyopathy. This seems to be an acute myocarditis. Very good point, Ashok. I agree with that. Um, next, um, Pichin, sorry, interrupted. Some things happen still. What happened is that we lo lo noted that there was actually acute lower limb ischemia in the limb that had the IVP implanted. And so uh, there was cold, there was pulses, became pallor, and it couldn't feel a Doppler pulse. So we, the, according to the vascular surgeon, went in and do a right groin exploration, removed the IBP, but they repaired the profunda femoris artery, uh, but we didn't see really much of a thrombus going on here, you know, uh, but certainly there was an uh, uh, angiogram done, there was physiotomy, uh, there was a wound that we mourned as well. And then things get worse as, as we go along uh, because over the next few days, uh, the whole lower limb becomes a mortar and cold. No pulse felt. Uh, there was evidence of rhabdomyolysis. Uh, CK go from 2008 to 15,000. Myoglobin go up from 2,000 to 25,000. There was gangrenous change over the, uh, uh, of the right lower limb and that uh, symbiotto calf compartment muscle was deemed non-viable. She underwent a uh, above knee amputation on day seven uh, for life salvage. So at, at this point, uh, can, can I ask Kim Hui for his thoughts here? Um, I'm just wondering whether, was it really related to the IBP insertion or was it um, just because of recumbency and DVT or whatever, but it's causing the acute limb ischemia and thrombosis? Is it related the to angiogram IBP? The angiogram didn't show a uh, clot, right? There's no uh, embolectomy done mm. for, the, for the leg. Um, Ashok, any thoughts there? No, I'm just thinking of any thrombotic disorder, but I just still, uh, no, I, I'm still in the same, same sphere as uh, 
as that uh, this is one of the mark ideas. This could be related to the balloon pump. Anyone else uh, from the fellows, Dr. Lam? Except, you know, there's, there's uh, one more point I've got. Jack, 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 is this, this, there could be a systemic disorder, uh, some form of a malproductive disorder affecting the myocardium as well as systemically creating increased thrombosis. Now that's something which, uh, which does happen and uh, we should be aware of. Dr. Grufen, you're saying vasculitis as well? Dr. Grufen, you want to make a comment? Yes, yes it is, was thought that it could be vasculitis, which might be leading you this or Dr. Lam, you also wanted to make a comment? Yeah, I, I would like to see, is it um, the, um, how, how's the other leg? How, how's the uh, perfusions in the other leg over the, um, over the other side with the VA ECMO implanted? Is the perfusions all right there? Yeah, it was okay. So thankfully we only yeah. have one leg to deal with. Yeah, but uh, I, I think um, one of the possibility, of course, the most common cause is the embolization because the, all these devices inside you and poor LV is uh, prone to have some um, uh, clots in the LV, aortic valves or whatsoever. Uh, but obviously the uh, uh, surgeons has performed angiogram of the legs and also uh, exploration it didn't show any um, uh, is, uh, and, uh, clot, blood clots found inside. So I think it's pretty much throughout the cause of uh, embolization. So the other thing is that um, I have encountered case that there's a in, uh, severe cardiogenic shock, uh, even with the VA ECMO inside you, there's a can um, reduce perfusions to the other legs as well, because due to the systemic uh, under perfusions. I'm not sure whether on the other side the VA ECMO um, catheter uh, implanted says a reperfusion catheter somehow is help the other legs, but on the other side, the systemic perfusion is still um, under perfused, which lead to this kind of uh, ischemia on the other side. Of mm. course, uh, I think other systemic uh, causes that uh, other colleagues have mentioned uh, would be other possibilities as well. Yeah. So, very good points. Uh, my thoughts at this juncture is this uh, you always have to watch for limb ischemia, digital ischemia, particularly when they go into this stage requiring VA ECMO. When the heart is very poorly uh, contracting, once the VA ECMO goes in, actually the aortic valve doesn't quite open. There's always some clots. The lead that usually get into trouble is the arterial side of the VA ECMO, less so the IBP side. Because the caliber of the uh, uh, catheter is a lot larger, usually 16 French. And therefore you do have to have an integrate perfusion catheter and watch out for distal limb ischemia. That's something you really watch out. There's a possibility that uh, before she was intubated, a peri, that event, a clot has gone down, not quite picked up. Uh, the IBP was in, ammo was in, and uh, subsequently became ischemic and uh, gangrenous requiring fasciotomy. So uh, again, I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, of course, systemic vasculitis is a consideration. Back to you, Huichin. Yeah, so what amazes us is the, the rapid uh, deterioration here. I mean, the limb was watched all the time. Interventions was very timely, getting vascular orthopedy to come in, and still the limb go on to progress to become manguinous, requiring an amputation. Uh, that's, uh, that's somewhat uh, amazing to us. But so more things happen here uh, as we go along. Uh, So we did a number of uh, respiratory uh, uh, septic workup here and all the cultures were negative. We think of everything uh, possible from the trip to Japan, uh, all the virus. Uh, we don't have COVID at that time. So, so anyway, all the bacterial culture, viral cultures were all negative. She was started on the broad spectrum antibiotics. All the autoimmune screens were also uh, normal uh, during that time. So more complications happen. She had ischemic hepatitis. She went into acute renal shutdown with the rhabdomyolysis. We needed to uh, start her on dialysis. Uh, during the period of time, she was uh, noted to have hypertensive episodes of mean arterial pressure of 110. So we actually have to use nitroprusside to uh, bring down the BP uh, during the course of uh, ICU stay. And she also manifests uh, this uh, diffuse encephalopathic feature was mentally obtunded, uh, you know, couldn't... Uh, couldn't quite, uh, you know, response uh, rationally, but CT scan of the brain showed no acute abnormality. Any uh, thoughts? One, 
Um, one thought I may have, because this patient have a, a um, such a uh, rapid deterioration and systemic involvement, and the uh, uh, real thing is that the patients uh, have some hypertensive episodes. So this is not compatible with usual myocarditis and cardiogenic shock. One of possibilities, the patient has few chromocytoma, and uh, with these uh, acute uh, episodes of hypertension and decompensations. I think uh, CT screening of any adrenal nodules and also tumors or other tumors in the abdomen is uh, one of the uh, options that we may have, we can consider. Very good. Uh, in the check, uh, Dr. Lam, I will agree with that. Uh, anyone else want to provide some uh, hints of what you will do or your thoughts? If not, back to you, Hui Chin. So we went back to the history again uh, of this patient. Remember, she has a very strong family history of hypertension. So she actually also had hypertension during her pregnancy. BP systolic was, went up to 200. But after her pregnancy, her BP was uh, normalized. Uh, she did say that she has an uh, episodic uh, palpitation one to two times per month associated with sweating and headache and hand tremor. But usually this uh, will resolve spontaneously and she could tolerate all the symptoms quite well. So she didn't think very much of it. But her mother had a hypertension uh, at the age of 36 and underwent uh, abdominal surgery according to the patient. Then we decided to, well, uh, better do some endocrine workup here. So this was the uh, plasma catecholamines results that were sent off. Uh, but this patient was in a stress state at that point in time. You know, so this is a non-epinephrine, epinephrine and dopamine. But we thought about the free chromocytoma. And so we went on to do the standard, uh, standard of care test now, which is your plasma fractionated free metanephrine and non-metanephrine and uh, urine metanephrine and non-metanephrine. This we even have to send to Mayo Clinic uh, for the uh, blood test. And so this was the results here showing that there was an elevations of free metanephrine and uh, non-metanephrine. So the final diagnosis. Uh, Ashok. Field chromocytoma. Uh, yeah, so this mean? is a field chromocytoma, you know, yeah. with a crisis state in somebody with hypertension and uh, hypotension coming yeah. in with a poor LV function. So we went on to do a CT abdomen as uh, suggested by Dr. Lam. This is a CT abdomen. If you look at the CT abdomen, there's uh, two huge adrenal uh, masses that we can see. And when we subject this to a uh, metabolic test, a PET CT, gallium, the Dotonoc test, and both were found to be metabolically active, consistent with uh, bilateral uh, field chromocytoma. And when we do diagnose a field chromocytoma, we have to do other screening as well. So we went on to do an ultrasound scan of the thyroid. There's actually a nodule noted in the uh, left lobe of the uh, patient's uh, thyroid, uh, but it doesn't look suspicious at this point in time for malignancy. So indeed, this is a patient with field chromocytoma. And so what is field chromocytoma? Uh, it is a rare catecholamine secreting tumors. It presents as a symptomatic tumors or incidentalomas. So symptoms is only present in 50% of patients and typically paroxysmal. And that's why this patient have been having symptoms of the three Ps for a long time, pain, palpitation, as well as perspiration. 90% of the field chromocytomas are located in the adrenal glands. It accounts for a very small percentage of patients with hypertension, 10% of which are metastatic. And when you diagnose somebody who have field chromocytoma, you have to look out for familiar syndromes. Multiple endocrine neoplasias occurs in 50% of cases Von Hippo, Lindau, to VHL, 20%, and neurofibromatosis, 3% of cases. So this is a classical triad, and the features is one of severe hypertension to circulatory failure and shock with uh, involvement of multiple organ symptoms, which is quite clear in this, our patient. So this is our patient. So actually, she's got a uh, field chromocytoma in the adrenal gland. She has some thyroid nodules, so she's classified as a MEN 2A. And so this is a typical uh, field chromocytoma, uh, histological pictures, a uh, very nested sort of arrangement surrounded by fibromuscular uh, stroma. And so what happens to the field uh, myocardium during a field chromocytoma crisis? Uh, because of the massive release of catecholamines, this can cause tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. In fact, excessive uh, adrenergic stimulation may also cause coronary vasospasm resulting in myocardial ischemia and subsequent uh, cardiomyopathy. In a series report, reported from Mayo Clinic, 11 cases were diagnosed. 
they present with dilated cardiomyopathy, pulmonary edema, sudden death, severe sepsis, marker that is acute myocardial infarction or cardiogenic shock. So a sort of a myriad presentation here, but characterized here by the hypertensive episodes. And actually, Takosubo cardiomyopathy uh, is one of the presentations of uh, field chromocytoma, although it didn't quite uh, appear uh, like that in our patients on her LV gram. And actually, field chromocytoma has been well known to be associated with critical peripheral ischemia at the same time. And so this is exactly what happened to our patients. There have been many, many reports of a field chromocytoma associated limb ischemia. And oftentimes it occurs in middle age of women between the 40 to 50 years old of age, and there's no direct correlation with metanephrine level. So we, we didn't feel so bad after learning about this field chromocytoma induced peripheral uh, ischemia. We thought it was our IBP and so forth. But clearly you can see that from the various case report, uh, you can have a critical limb ischemia involving the hands as well as the legs and so forth. And so how do we treat these patients? Uh, so typically you should be concentrating on hemodynamic stabilization, uh, aggressive intravascular fluid resuscitation as a first line therapy, uh, complicate, complemented by vasopressor and inotropes if it's shock. And this will be followed by medical treatment with an alpha blocker such as a benzophenoxybenzamine, which is a non-selective alpha blockers. And uh, you can also use prazosine, but you would add on a, a beta blocker after you have stabilized the patients with an alpha blocker to achieve a full uh, adrenergic blockade. So the clinical uh, cause of this lady of ours, she was actually managed by a whole diff, uh, diff, uh, multidisciplinary team from cardiology to cardiac surgeon to endocrine nephrology and respiratory. So we managed to decannulate her MO on day four. She responded to treatment, extubated day 10, dialysis, discontinued day 19. Transthoracic echo, actually day seven shows dramatic recovery of the LV function after you have stabilized her hemodynamics. BP initially was controlled with amlodipine, clonidine, brazosine, but started on phenoxybenzamine subsequently. And this is a fairly high dose of phenoxybenzamine that was being given to this patient. She underwent a bilateral adrenalectomy day 30, and she went for a prophylactic total thyroidectomy and parathyroidectomy a year later uh, to prevent uh, or to in anticipation of possible malignant uh, transformation. She was actually subsequently discharged to a community hospital after about a year, a month and a half stay in the hospital. And uh, she's actually currently well. So she's actually four years out, four and a half years out from her field chromocytomic uh, cytoma crisis and she's now expecting her second baby uh, under our follow-up and the uh, gen genetic study of that fetus did not show any uh, any uh, 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 gene that would suggest that she might get uh, some form of familiar field chromocytoma. So, so that's the case for the today, uh, field chromocytoma crisis in a young lady. Fantastic, Richie. Uh, Ashok, your comments first. I think, I think it's a great case. Uh, you know, I think what Huichim does is, is, firstly, of course, it reminds us, and clearly when, when uh, Dr. Lam mentioned about chromocytoma, I said, ah, that's what it has to be. Uh, and it just brings back everything that we've learned over a period of time, because we don't see them so commonly. Many of what, much of what we learned in uh, uh, med school and subsequently in our younger age group just falls apart when we see those routine cases day after day that you've really got to recollect, revise. And, and uh, that's why I enjoy this. I come to uh, these sessions, not as an expert, but equally as to remind myself, to revise myself, and to again go back to those rare causes which we should, should keep in mind. They're not rare when they, they present. Yes, they're unusual, but then unless we, we actually have them in our minds, we will not be able to diagnose when the right patient comes. So I think this has been a great session. I think it's been a tremendous learning for all of us. So the fellows there should not think that they were here and we were the experts sitting and, and knew it all. Uh, we ourselves were feeding our case, uh, our, our thoughts through the cases as much as you were. And I think it's been a great, tremendous interaction. I think the, the who teams, uh, especially, I, I'm sure you're writing a book on all these unusual cases. Uh, then uh, I guess if you write a book, nobody will be attending all these sessions. I'm sure there are hundreds who are attending, hundreds and hundreds who are attending these sessions just to learn about this. But it's great for us. I was just going to say that 
we should Tata Subo is a form of uh, uh, again a similar form of a kari karimayapati. Tiochromocytoma does exactly the same. Uh, increased catecholamine secretion, vasoconstriction, and that's what happens in Takasubo. So you're right by pointing out the fact that Takasubo is a form of pheochromocytoma creates a form of a Takasubo myocarditis or the other way around. And I think that's a very important aspect to keep in mind. And by the way, Takasubo should be kept in mind. Theoretically, it is practical for, uh, uh, you know, you, you can see a typical case and that's usually in the middle age, and that's usually after a stress, et cetera. But We've seen Takasubos at the age of 30 after severe exercise, after pregnancies, after, after uh, numerous issues of, and even without stress. And that again, but I think uh, I, I, it could be focal, but it could be diffuse. So mechanism of actions in pheochromocytoma and Takasuba are similar. It's just that you, you really presented a great case of pheochromocytoma crisis, but Takasubo can actually happen at all ages as well. Great points, Ashok. Give me your last comment. I can't agree more. I think there's so much learning for everyone here. And I really appreciate the NUH team and for the successful diagnosis management of this lady, which otherwise would have been just almost, uh, almost no, no hope, actually. It also brings to the point that we all often so focused in our job, this cardiology. We're just thinking about the heart. We really need to think about outside the box and then to health help and consult with the others, uh, fellow colleagues and specialties, really help to bring the whole picture together. And it's not easy to have this kind of cases where you have multidiscipline to get commonly together to manage one diagnosis or at least diagnose the, the diagnosis. It's a great case. I always uh, learn so much from Huichin. I don't know how many more he has in his bag, but every time I come, I learn so much from him. Thank you very much, Huichin and Jack for, for organizing this. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. So I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone, particularly... Professor Dan Chim, who fourth episode, I, I can't imagine will come fourth episode of so many unusual causes of AMI, but it's really quite amazing. And I, I agree with uh, Ashok, we are learning from each other. I see the participants also raising excellent points and clinching the diagnosis earlier than any of the professors here. And uh, we, we saw that Dr. Lam actually hit on the nail of the coronavirus uh, crisis earlier on. So congratulations as well. So great, great points, everyone. I look forward to the fifth episode, which he, so far you have not disappointed. And I look forward to the next uh, series of APSC Fellows Course, Save a Life. With that, I thank everyone for your time and keep safe. Goodbye. And, do, uh, yeah. and an award for Dr. Lam. I think you, know, <laughs> you should have an APSC Fellows Award for today. <laughs> so today it goes to our fellow from Hong Kong. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, bye. Goodbye, bye-bye.